Well, I would like to welcome everybody to this uh, very interesting session here in, in Summer Davos. And uh, personally, uh, I believe uh, the subject matter of this uh, session, uh, the future of Chinese manufacturing, is probably the single most important question for the Chinese economy, which is seriously slowing down right now. If we get this question right, uh, we'll get many other things right. If we get this wrong, then nothing else really matters. Uh, and we're very privileged to have some very distinguished participants for this panel. And uh, I would like to uh, introduce uh, them all to you at the very beginning. Um, Kevin Rudd, who is a member of the Australian Parliament, also the 26th Prime Minister of uh, Australia, who was also the very first Chinese-speaking leader of a major Western country. Mr. Kevin Rudd. And uh, Carlos Gong. Uh, a household name in the uh, manufacturing, uh, in the car manufacturing sector, who successfully turned around Nissan many years ago, the CEO of Renault Nissan. Uh, FICA, who is uh, chairman and CEO of uh, DSM, one of the largest uh, chemical companies uh, in, in Europe. Um, and uh, Mr. Xu Heyi, who is uh, chairman and CEO of Beijing Automotive Group, who is also the Chinese partner for. Uh, Mercedes and, and Hyundai, whose company manufactures both Chinese uh, local brands and uh, international brands. And last and certainly not the least, Gary Coleman, who is the Managing Director of Global Industries of Deloitte, who is uh, uh, an expert in a lot of industries, uh, particularly in the manufacturing world. Uh, and I would like to uh, begin by throwing out the first uh, question that uh, most of the Chinese CEOs uh, have right now. It's a, there's a big debate in China right now, uh, which is also the reason why uh, this team, uh, our team at CCTV, which produces China's most watched uh, TV show on business and economy every day, chose this subject matter. Because uh, most of the CEOs in China have come to realize that, first of all, uh, we have to be very careful because the last 10 years, uh, China has given a lot of resources, a lot of attention to the financial sector. Uh, and uh, the manufacturing sector seems to have lost steam in certain areas. Many of the uh, largest corporations in manufacturing in China uh, probably made more money or profit from their financial investment rather than their core manufacturing business. This is a very dangerous trend. and. Uh, this is certainly a trend that we're trying to contain as well. And, uh, and secondly, there has there's been a national debate on uh, what might be the right uh, development model for China's manufacturing uh, for the next uh, five to 10 years. Should we continue what we're best at, which is uh, our uh, low-end, so-called low-end manufacturing? Our core competitiveness is still uh, probably our um, more affordable labor cost, our favorable policies, uh, that we should stay at this where we are in the, in the distribution of labor, or should we seek to um, transcend made in China to what we call the, the created uh, in China format. So such is uh, a big debate in the country, and increasingly more CEOs are saying that probably, particularly at a time of global downturn, we should focus more on the traditional strength of Chinese manufacturing, which brings us to uh, our first uh, question. We do have a, a piece of small board next to you. Um, and um, if you can take it out, and there is a question, number, number one question, uh, which is, what do you think is the way out for Chinese manufacturing? Should we strengthen our low-end advantages or should we move to the high-end model as quickly as possible? You also have a pen that we hope you can draw a circle of your choice. Which will, and your choices will be our um, first uh, topic of discussion. So what does it want us to do? do, do, do. Circle. Just put circle. a number on it. OK. Whatever we want to discuss first. A or B. Okay. If you have to choose one. Uh, I mean, 
We, we cannot choose none or both. <laughs> uh, the answer is both. Uh, okay. A and B. <laughs> you have to choose one. You have to, you have to choose one. Not, you can't choose both. <laughs> you have to be TV friendly. You have to be TV friendly. Okay, TV friendly. Yeah. Okay. We don't have to be. We don't have to worry about being politi politically correct or or appropriate I know, or we have diplomatic. To, now, okay. no, we have to be right. It's not politically Transforming correct. Transforming into high-end manufacturing. Uh, Xu Zhong, your that answer is written? Let me look. Mr. Xu, did you have an answer? High-end. Transforming to a high-end. And transforming into high-end. Mm. So <laughs> it's it's pretty obvious. It's pretty obvious that uh, you all uh, have the same conclusion. Whereas many of China's top economists, some of them here at the Samo Davos, believe the contrary, that China should uh, probably remain and stay uh, and uh, where she is right now. Why don't we begin with uh, Gary? Yeah. So I chose uh, uh, high end. Um, to, to put that into context, uh, Today, uh, China has uh, probably close to 20% of global manufacturing output on a global basis. That's on par with the United States, and that's something to be proud of and something that is competitive. Uh, China today has uh, abundance of engineers and scientists. Uh, that's also good. Uh, you still uh, maintain on a relative basis, maybe not where you were five or 10 years ago, a low cost environment. And that's why you've been competitive, and that's why probably in the near term, you're going to be competitive. But if you were to ask uh, global CEOs around the world who manufacture and make product, what is the number one future criteria of being successful in the future, they would probably tell you that it's talent, and in particular talent that uh, creates innovation. And when I use the word innovation, I don't mean just innovation around products. I'm talking about innovation uh, for business processes, product development, marketing expertise, logistics expertise, customer support. And when I think about that future criteria, uh, my answer comes out to be uh, high-end manufacturing. OK. Um, I would like to provide some more facts and information for you to consider. Uh, and play the devil's advocate here. Um, the, the strengths of Chinese manufacturing have very often been exaggerated because uh, the perception of China has a lot to do with size. China is now the second largest economy in the world, uh, and people see a lot of Olympics, the Shanghai World Expo, people see a lot of uh, the most uh, amazing, dazzling part of Chinese economy, but without realizing that in specific areas, China is, uh, still lags far behind. Uh, for instance, I was telling some of the uh, media people here at the conference yesterday that in China we have a national pastime, which is to make fun of our male soccer team, who never made it into uh, a major game of the, of the World Cup. Uh, and the Chinese male soccer team currently ranks 87th in the world, probably, uh, which is very disappointing for Chinese people. But uh, if it, when it comes to manufacturing, in many particular products, uh, the Chinese ranking is uh, well behind 200. Uh, and recently we had a forum in Beijing with the, uh, the Vice Minister of, Ch of, of Industry in China, together with the CEOs of 20 what we call the strategically important manufacturing business in China, i.e. the companies responsible for making heavy machinery, um, airplanes, etc., etc. And the conclusion was very disappointing. Our minister uh, took out a small bearing just a few iron bars and, the, and, and a metal uh, cover. And uh, for what we call the high precision bearing used in uh, very, in, very uh, uh, important heavy machinery, uh, China cannot make that. We'll have to import those things. China does not yet have the core technology to make that, that bearing. It's uh, the result uh, a lot more disappointing than most of, the, most of us think or what would, uh, would, we would like it to be. So the challenge is, while we're moving up the so-called value chain and try to be more competitive in the upper end, sometimes we forgot to build upon our strengths to the extent that uh, we, we lost our competitive advantage. That's probably the reason why 
we saw quite a number of uh, foreign businesses moving its factories out of China and uh, setting up new factories in, in South America or uh, um, uh, some, some other South Asian countries. What do you think, FICA? Well, uh, first of all, I don't know how many Europeans are in the room because I feel a little bit awkward advising China what to do. Um, <laughs> and the reverse effect that could have if I give good advice for Europe. Um, but let me uh, start picturing the scene a little bit. You mentioned China is the second largest economy in the world. Um, I don't want to reduce the fun, but you are, China is the third largest economy in the world. Because the first economy in the world is Europe, but they hide themselves very, very uh, well. So nobody noticed that Europe is the first economy in the world. And being divided between 27 countries, uh, if we continue with that, nobody will notice. Having said so, um, um, I don't know, China, as I see the development, went into four different phases. And the first phase is that China opened up uh, after Deng Xiaoping with a big market, and everybody thought, hey, that's a big market to sell your products. Then China started manufacturing and became the manufacturing machine of the world, and even reinforced in the third phase inviting other people to manufacture also in China, like many Western companies do. Will that be the end game that China will only focus on manufacturing? Well, what is the core competences of China, especially low cost? Low cost manufacturing is the way China played, played the game. Uh, in the future, it will not only be about low cost of personnel or wages, which are, by the way, increasing in China, but also how you do that in an uh, environmentally friendly way, and that is a concern in China, and otherwise it will not be sustainable. What about energy? What about the cost of energy? We see at this moment that the United States has positioned itself over the last couple of years very well, and some companies are rethinking their manufacturing strategy back to the United States. So the world is not stable, and in terms of low cost, China is increasing its wages, and countries like Vietnam, etc., are coming up. So I think China is automatically moving into the fourth phase in which innovation brands will play a role. And I think it is almost inevitable for China to go that direction. That does not mean that China should forget. Therefore, I circled the first one also a little bit. China should not forget the first one, uh, low-cost manufacturing, because at this moment, that is quite a core of the business. And before you really move on to something else, keep also your current core. And uh, Carlos, what do you think? What, give us your, your, your explanation for your answer. Well, uh, let, me, let me tell you, that mean, uh, I obviously answered that we need to do both, but you said I need to focus only on one of them. <laughs> then uh, I, I have to talk about the high-end manufacturing. High-end manufacturing meaning every single industrial power in the world started with the low cost. I mean, this is the history of our industry. Japanese started with the low cost, the Koreans started with the low cost, everybody started there, and China started there, and is doing it very well. But you can't st stop there, because if you want to continue to develop the economy, you have to move to the high-end manufacturing without abandoning your low cost. Uh, so, in a certain way, you have to do both, but if we have to choose one, obviously the migration tower, high-end manufacturing is absolutely necessary. I think China has everything to be successful in this quest. Uh, this kind of transformation takes time. We have to be patient. This is not something which can be done in one generation. It often takes uh, two or three generations before it's being done well. Um, but I can tell you from uh, the experience of, uh, for example, car manufacturing, where we have to assemble many technologies and we have to compete uh, against practically all the other car manufacturers in the world, particularly in China, uh, the, the, the workforce is capable, uh, the training is very efficient, uh, there is plenty of investments and money. Uh, I think uh, the policy of the government is encouraging a lot, encouraging a lot the transfer of technology and this kind of move. So I don't see personally a lot, any big obstacle in front of this realization except the fact that we're just going to have to be patient. These kind of transformation take a lot of time. And, uh, you know, there is nothing wrong about what's happening today. It's just a process which is 
taking place. And this is going to be done by the Chinese companies, and this is going to be done also by the foreign companies in, uh, in China. It's interesting, even as you take an example, the car manufacturing, at the beginning, car manufacturers started to do, you know, very uh, low-cost, price-sensitive cars. They moved up, and now the luxury cars are coming in, in, into China, which is, in a certain way, a translation of the fact that you can find the suppliers, you can find the technology, and you can do a good job practically at all the levels of the chain of offer. It, tell me, Carlos, is it, is it now relatively cheaper to make cars in South, certain Southeast Asian countries or Latin America than in China already? Yeah, it is true. It is true. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah it is true. That means you compare today the cost, total cost of a car in China to the total cost of a car in Mexico. Mexico. Take Mexico. Uh, or you can take even uh, countries in southeast of Asia, it's cheaper. It's cheaper, uh, you know, uh, by, by, by taking the total cost of the car at the end of the plant. But then you have to transport the car. That's why if you want to compete in China, you have to produce it in China. It doesn't make any sense to bring the car from the southeast of Asia to China or from Mexico to China. It doesn't make sense. But fundamentally, and, you know, in a certain way, it's a normal move. It's a normal move. It's maybe the translation of the fact that China little by little is moving toward higher end manufacturing by leaving some of the, the other work move to Vietnam or move to uh, Cambodia or move to the other countries. And now we would like to uh, ask Mr. Xu Hei to contribute. Mr. Xu is also uh, the CEO, the leader of a major Chinese automotive company. Uh, but if we take a look at um, the automobile industry in China, I have to say it's, it's quite disappointing for the, the patriots in China because the Chinese automobile industry started roughly at the same time with, uh, uh, with its Japanese counterparts and, and South Korean counterparts. And uh, you know, a few decades passed, most of the cars in, in Japan and uh, in South Korea are local brands, South Korean brands or Japanese brands, whereas in China, uh, probably most of the cars uh, in, on China's roads are still uh, foreign brands. And uh, I remember that at the very beginning, we have this assumption that we have to surrender certain market share or a lot of market share to foreign brands in exchange for core technology. But it seems that three decades or four decades have passed. We have surrendered most of the markets, yet we have not uh, secured the technology yet. Sure. Well, and back to the board, the question of the board. My question is very clear that it's transforming the high-end manufacturing. For this subject, as the China's manufacturer, including auto industry, and the question is how to make it sustainable, how to make it uh, made in China to a strong manufacturing. And same with the auto industry, we should move to high end. It has two contents. So the first meaning is that whether we are having high end or low end product, and the other significance is that concerning about the whole product manufacturing chain, are we just starting from the low end or high end? For example, many of the iPads that we are using now, the iPhones. Obviously, they are manufacturing in the Cantonese area, Shenzhen or Guangdong. But this is actually the lowest assembling end which are putting into China as the manufacturing center. Is it really high end? Actually, we are still processing it. This is the low end. And of course, there are some mechanical products whereby the lower end or the very low end supply chain are still in China. We have been doing these types of low end manufacturing for decades. Is it sustainable? I don't think so. So the answer is pretty clear. So in order to change uh, China from big manufacturing manufacturing nation to a strong manufacturing nation, we need to really move from the low end to the high end. So this is my answer. Concerning about the auto industry, let's have a look. Just now, our anchor has clearly mentioned about the development 20 
through eight years ago, starting from 1984 when we started up our joint venture. Yes, indeed, the joint venture brand is the monopolizing the market instead of the localized brand market. Uh, of course, actually, there is an obvious trend of the downwarding or the decline of the market share of our localized brand for the last several years. This is really absurd. With the wave of the third industrial wave, especially with the restructuring and reshuffling of the industrialization in the emerging nations, in the advanced nations, I think we are facing a great challenge. So our answer is very pretty clear about the topic. So, so I am concerned about the problems that we are facing now. We want to move up to the high end. However, we couldn't really reach it, and then we lose the advantages of the low end. So that is how we put it in the Chinese proverb. We lose the eggs and the chicken at the same time, especially when the global economy experiences a depression. Yes, indeed, during this process, there might be an area that we lose both. But we don't need to be panic. Because during this process, even though we have witnessed such phenomenon, however, it will be only concentrated in a very specific areas. I believe the directions shall be correct, and we shall be held true to our direction, and we shouldn't just lose our clear directive, which is really very important. Kevin. I think there's a danger when we have this discussion in China and that we are looking at it within uh, a vacuum. <clears throat> the uh, challenges to manufacturing are global. Uh, China, largest manufacturing country in the world, is part of a global challenge to manufacturing, which is in itself in a state of uh, revolution. There was a good piece, I think, in The Economist uh, recently, a month or two ago, which uh, referred to manufacturing's uh, third industrial revolution. Therefore, all the technologies which are driving change in manufacturing are impacting here in China as well. Uh, the big drivers, uh, the nanotechnologies, the new materials, robotics, artificial intelligence, um, also um, uh, 3D printing. This is transforming manufacturing across the world, and therefore it's having its impact here as well in China. The second point I'd make is that I do not see China, <clears throat> based on the analysis that I've seen, is passive in responding to that. And what I see in many, on the part of many large-scale Chinese manufacturers is an active response in their own um, R&D programs. Robotics, for example, in China is not exotic, it's mainstream. And uh, the uh, large-scale input of megatronics and robotics in some of the large manufacturers is at world scale. I think the challenge for our friends in China uh, is to make sure that the other inputs to productivity uh, are also being met, and that goes to the development of uh, skills and enterprise for the future as well. I think this was touched on at the very beginning. If this uh, te revolution technology is underway, <clears throat> It must be accompanied by a parallel revolution in how you train your human capital uh, to use it. Um, that is a challenge for China right now. I think there's a third point I'd make as well. In China, uh, there is a core point about securing long-term finance also for these sorts of uh, creative industries uh, and their R&D components. And this goes to the heart also of the encouragement of the non-state sector in this economy as well. State enterprises play a large role, uh, and there are some fantastic ones in terms of the quality of the product that they produce. But I think if you're going to keep ahead uh, of the <clears throat> creative curve and the cost curve, making sure that your private manufacturers in the private economy are having sufficient access to market and sufficient access to capital is equally important. My concluding point, Chang'ang, is this. This is why I agree with Carlos before. We tick both the boxes. China, while it is still part of the global manufacturing revolution, is itself unique. Let's just call it for what it is. 1.3 billion people is unique in this world by a long, long measure. Therefore, 
the actual structure of China's domestic demand for its own manufacturing uh, products <clears throat> will be such that it will continue to consume labour-intensive, low-end manufacturers and at the same time move across the rest of the manufacturing spectrum simultaneously. And similarly in terms of supplies of domestic labour, it is still at this stage relatively true that as you move from Yanhai and you move to Zhongbu and you go to Xibu, you are moving through the entire wage gradation and this will occur over time. That's why I believe, intelligently planned, but with a vibrant private sector in manufacturing as well, China is able to achieve the transformation in, with both uh, industry elements, high end and low end, developing simultaneously, but it cannot avoid the high end because the technological revolution in global manufacturing is there for all of us, including the PRC. Mm. Uh, I think Kevin hit upon a very important subject matter, which is the so-called third industrial revolution. There are some new technologies that are, promises, uh, that are, that are promising to be uh, game changers. And uh, there are talks that probably the next wave of prosperity in manufacturing will occur uh, back in the developed world, back in Europe, back in Japan, back in the United States. What, what do you think, Baika? Well. Of course, innovation and technology plays a key role. Um, and therefore, also for China, there's no way out. Technology development, innovation should play a key role. Coming back first on the first, um, the low cost was the driver. In the future, for manufacturing, you need to have your whole act together. And that means also you need to be able to produce ecologically friendly in a sustainable way. Uh, you need to take care of low-cost energy, a uh, real issue of Europe, some concerns in China, a great position at this moment in the United States, big concerns in Japan. So different situations in the world. And your energy situation and your labor costs determine to a large degree also your manufacturing power, maybe even your whole success as an, as an economy. So those kind of things, your logistical situation, your value change, um, um, your talent base, like you were saying, uh, is very, very important. So uh, please, those basic things need to be in order and it will not only be locals driven. That does not take away that the technology development and innovation will play a key role in differentiating in the future amongst the different countries in the world. And it will be interesting to see how the next shifts will be, not only about technology, but also the other elements I mentioned. And Carlos, you've been referred to as a Steve Jobs of the car manufacturing industry by the press. Uh, if there's going to be a third industrial revolution, uh, what kind of role do you think China will play in it? Uh, well, you know, the, the, it's not if that, there is a third uh, revolution which is taking place, yeah. and it's due to the fact that oil is a problem, and second, the environment is a problem, and transportation, uh, like, particularly I'm talking about my sector as an example, transportation is seen as part of the problem because it's a big consumer of oil. And second, it's a contributor to the uh, global warming through the emission. So you can't continue like this. That means you're going to have to come with a product, a technology, a way of manufacturing which addresses issues. And uh, I must say that China will play a role. And I was uh, personally extremely encouraged when State Council take a very bold decision by saying in 2020, five million cars in China should be or electric cars or plug-in hybrids. Okay, five million. Starting from quasi zero today on a market of 18 million. And with the capacity of production in 2020 of two million cars. So uh, if... And there is no reason to doubt the fact that this is going to happen because China in the past have taken some bold objectives and made them happen. If this happened, China will be at the forefront of uh, the revolution that will take place in the car industry by bringing massively uh, zero emission cars or very low emission cars to the, to the market. And obviously these cars are going to be manufactured in China. So it's not a question of importing this car from outside. You're going to have to create suppliers of batteries. You're going to have to create suppliers of motors, of alternators, 
And this is going to help a lot the development of new technology and making China one of the largest base of uh, the new technology that is going to be contributing to, to the market. So I don't think it's if it's, it is happening, but usually revolution, when they take place, we never notice them when they are taking place. We notice them after they take place. But this one is taking place now, and it looks like all the decisions taken in China are going, into the, are going, in my opinion, in the right direction. I would like to open the uh, discussion to the floor, and uh, I would like to encourage all of you to, to give uh, advice and suggestions for China uh, on the subject matter of the, uh, the manufacturing's uh, next solution. And as Fiker has said, the entire world has been offering advice for Europe, <laughs> and Europe has no problem with it. And, uh, and China, of course, deserves some advice. And uh, um, maybe David Michael? Can we have a, a microphone for first roll? Well, D pad, D pad, yes, yeah. Thanks, Chang'an. If I come back to the big question you posed at the beginning of the discussion, which is what's the link between uh, the health of China's economy generally and manufacturing, I think the missing word in the debate so far is the word productivity. China's manufacturing costs are going up. But if productivity goes up faster than costs, then the middle class grows, consumer power is there, and China is competitive in manufacturing. So my question to the panel is, what's the specific roadmap for China's manufacturing productivity to get better? What has to happen to make that work? Do we have another question or comment before we ask the panel to, to answer that question? You sure you have a... You have a you have a point to contribute? Uh, I think uh, the answer is uh, the uh, China is not a question about comment. We are living in a very competitive and dynamic world, and we have to win. If we lose, we are at the mercy of the market, and therefore we have to win. In order to win, we need to have a strategy. In case of China, I think there is an advantage in terms of scale. No matter what you do in terms of high-end, low-end, the scale is so much important. Second is scope. Scope is so much important. So that by taking advantage of like low cost, you know, in case of China, it's, uh, there's an inland region as well, like, as well as coastal regions, so you can take advantage of regions, as well as the speed. <clears throat> when I look back, I'm from Japan. When I look back in 1997, when there was Asian financial crisis, Korean friends told me that you know, there's Korean will never be you know, catching up with Japan. Now you, you look at what's happening in terms of Korean companies catching up. I agree to Carlos in a way that you know, China should be patient as well as think about strategy and the strategy to win. I think you know, uh, it's, it's just a matter of time. Mm. Let's go back to the, to the panel. There are uh, certain economists suggesting that um, the labor cost in China is actually even higher than that of the United States, precisely because uh, even though American workers might be paid with more dollars, but their productivity is much higher than in China. So in total, it's actually cheaper than China. Gary? Yeah, let, let's, let's uh, address the gentleman's question and, and also uh, answer why that is so. Uh, we talked about the third industrial revolution coming here, and we talked, there was somebody that mentioned certain 3D printing, etc. But think about what that does to the actual shop floor or the actual production piece of the global value chain. Uh, what it does is it, is, it, is it changes it. And when you add to that the increasing trade proliferation that will occur, and I use that in a very positive business sense, what you'll see is less people on the production floor, and you'll see more people engaged in manufacturing enterprises who have skill sets around information technology, around product development, market research, branding, logistics, and customer support. So the result of all that is that the cost component of that piece of production is much, much less to the overall value of what's being created. And, and that's going to cause, uh, that is why um, the cost advantage of production is becoming less than what it, what it was 10 or 20 years ago when Western companies came to China for lower production costs. It meant a lot that to the entire value chain. But tomorrow, with the trade and with, and with the changing of the shop floor, 
that piece of production is going to, to be less. And so to the gentleman's question, uh, where is it that China is going to place its bet in that value chain? I don't see how it can be only in that piece of production. There has to be something else along that entire supply chain, whether it's product development, whether it's market research, customer support, somehow China has to find another piece of value uh, uh, in order to play in the game and, and not get left behind. I do endorse this gentleman's idea. Yes, indeed. When we just talk about cost, it is really not a single idea or a simple idea of a labor cost. It is about the cost of the whole supply chain. From this competitive economic world, the labor cost of China is on a rise indeed. However, the competitiveness of the labor cost is still remained. Actually, it has remained very competitive from a labor cost perspective. These type of competitiveness, I believe, will continue. Unlike some area, for example, in certain regions of China, indeed, we have a lack of labor. There will be a rise in their salary and wages. So people begin to create such high types of like rumors saying that there is a huge surging of the cost of labor cost. I don't think so. It is not as serious as that. I don't know whether you have got the latest the statistics. Some colleagues of mine is reporting the pressure of the downward trend of our economy in the Yanzi Delta River area. Many traditional manufacturing industries is having a kind of laid off surge. There is a higher percent of 7%, 9%, even 10%, some even higher more than. 30% of the workers laid off. So people believe that the call of the problem is that, except that we are having an economic downward cycle, while well, at the same time it also mentioned about the lack of the labor itself, and also the rising of the cost of the labor, and also about some mechanism in this regard. So what is your idea? I believe currently in the coastal areas, there is such a downward trend or some economy was experiencing a depression which leads to the laid off the work laid off of the workers I think we are majorly influenced by the international market which has a radiating effect to China because they are mostly export oriented they rely on the international market so I guess it is major because of that mainly because of that and also in the Cantonese area in Guangdong there are some phenomena that some small and medium enterprises, SMEs in the manufacturing industry. The shortage of laborers because of the insufficient supply of laborers or workers or because of the intense competition, there is an uh, increase of the labor costs. Oh, well, there is such a phenomenon. But we should not uh, read this as the major mainstream. And some of the industries in coastal areas or enterprises are migrating to uh, hinterland areas because they have a lower labor costs. This is a trend. But I still think the product and the market is important. Hinterland areas, especially uh, central and west part of the country, if their markets are you know, overseas, then they have the problem of uh, logistic uh, costs and decision-making costs would prove to be a menace. Although they have the lower labor costs, yet they have an increase of the overall costs. Oh. Any other comments? Yeah. In terms of um, productivity, um, you can look from different angles of productivity. Um, the um, output per labor or per uh, person involved, but at the end of the day, that's also not relevant. At the end of the day, the only relevant thing is what is the cost per produced unit? And to that extent, you could say that China is producing too cheap at this moment, or at least unsustainable cheap, 
because the cost of the environment will go up, the cost of quality will go up, and the cost of energy will go up. So those factors will reduce automatically the productivity cost per unit, whilst maybe due to technology and other things, the productivity go up. If we come back to the debate, I think there is no choice. China need to be both low end and high end. However, in one company, that combination is not easy to manage. So uh, there will be all kinds of debates and there may be certain companies can do this, certain other companies can do that, because two different cultures in one organization is different. You can go further, are two different cultures in one country possible? I would guess that China is big enough to do that, although Japan did not succeed in doing that, United States did not succeed in doing that, and many European countries did not succeed in doing that in a country. Though I would say China is big enough to do both, low end and high end, but realize uh, that not many countries uh, did that successful combination. This whole debate, if I make my last statement, seems to start from the premises and the, 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 the assumption that anyway China will focus on manufacturing, whether it is low end or high end. And I find that an interesting um, uh, observation. And I think that it's a very good choice for China. That is my big concern about Europe big concern about the United States and maybe also Japan. Because those countries, those societies focus on so-called knowledge-based, innovation-based economy. And in many sectors, in my belief, innovation and technology cannot do without manufacturing. And if the manufacturing leaves, then over time also the innovation and the R&D will leave because in many sectors those need to be combined. And if China will choose, choose anyway, for manufacturing, that is a competitive advantage which many other areas in the world should think about. Because at the long end, that combination uh, is needed. you have a point to add? Uh, j just about the productivity in China today, I, I think the situation is, today, uh, is, is very good. Again, um, we have probably 50 plants in the world, and there are in the United States, in Europe, in Japan, Thailand, Mexico, etc. Uh, every year, we make a classification of all the plants by productivity. Uh, this year, our number one, Renault and Nissan, uh, plant is Chinese, number one. Okay? And, and this is a plant which is relatively recent. Uh, and this is a very drastic uh, KPI that we follow, and it's not only based on cost. So today's situation is very good. Now, for the future, what the condition, when you take a look about what are the key of productivity, frankly, I think at the end of the day, it relies on... Are you still an environment who is learning? And second, are you an environment which is ready to implement? Okay? If you say yes to the two questions, you don't have to worry about it. You know? Because at the end of the day, the key of productivity is making sure that the best practices, it's not only a question of cost. You know? Because you have a lot of countries where costs are very low, it doesn't make them very productive countries. Okay? And we know a lot of them. The basic is, is, is from in a, in a certain way, the fact that you have the best practices, you are capable to implement your best practices into the country, and at the same time, you have a reasonable cost environment. And it is the case of China today. And as long as China is willing to open up to the world, bring foreign investments, allow competition between Chinese and non-Chinese, learn from the non-Chinese some of the best practices, implement and have the courage to implement some of these best practices, because it's not, not always easy, I think China is going to be in great shape. A lot of the problems that we're seeing, particularly in Europe, is not so much about learning, because Europe has a lot of knowledge. The problem is implementation. That means from time to time, you know that this is a best practice, but for certain reasons, you don't want to implement, or you cannot implement. So again, learning and implementation, if, if, you, if we continue in China to have both, then I don't think there is any worry about, about productivity. And I don't think we should summarize it to only a cost issue. But exactly as you said, uh, China has opened up to the, uh, the world's leading car manufacturers for, for decades, uh, and we have tried to introduce other practices, but still, Chinese uh, car manufacturers cannot make Chinese brands world-class engines or cars. How so? Well, you know, first, I, I think uh, we have to be patient. I personally have no doubt on the fact that within the next 10 years, you're going to have one, maybe two global Chinese car manufacturer popping up. I think this will happen, obviously, but you have to 
it, it will have to take some time. Look how much time it took to the Korean to generate one global car manufacturer. How much time and how much failures that have been go through until they generate one large company which is global today. Look how, how much time the Japanese took before transforming uh, their company and their name from low end, low cost, small cars to highly reliable and desirable brand. It took a lot of time. So I, I think we, we are looking at, we are in the middle of the movie. Uh, we, we didn't see the whole movie yet. So we just need to be a little bit patient to see the rest of it. Mm -hmm. I agree. <clears throat> Chung Gang, I agree with that. I remember I first came to China only about 25, 28 years ago. The big cars in town were called red flag limousines, okay? Hong Chi. And uh, this is only 25 years ago. For goodness sake. 25 years ago, I remember the first Korean brands arrived in Australia, okay? So the manufacturing history of this country is a relatively recent one at scale uh, in terms of international uh, markets. So I would agree. I have no background in the automobile industry, but I look at other Chinese brands acquiring global status. One will follow from the other. Can I answer the productivity question as well? I think there is a danger in us having a narrow view of productivity. The productivity debate, as you know, is a complex one for economists, is also a complex one for policymakers and for firms. But to narrow f focus it on pure labour costs or labour productivity is, I think, um, not productive itself. Um, obviously, the total factor productivity equation is made up of labour, it's made up of technology, and it's made up of skills of how you apply the technology in a given workplace or a given process. That's the equation. It's complex. It'll be different in one firm as opposed to another. But the key is this. If China continues to invest in the second element, which is R&D, so that the wave of disruptive change occurring across global manufacturing through the third industrial revolution is not going to hollow out Chinese manufacturing, but China will remain ahead of the curve, so long as it remains investing in that R&D and applying it uh, to its own manufacturing circumstances, then there will be Chinese global brands. And, uh, and to add one further point, so long as the other element of the productivity equation is also attended to, which is the investment in human capital. Mm -hmm. And the Pei Xun in that respect, the, the training in that respect, is not just mass training, it is precisely applied to the models which were described before. That is, a given car, a given product may require just two people working on it remotely, semi-remotely, but the skills componentry lying behind that will be huge. So who wins this race? Those who invest in R&D and those who invest in the high-end labour skills which are necessary to sustain that. And China is pretty smart at adapting. <clears throat> which brings us to uh, our next uh, question on the little board today. Uh, we have a question which is, uh, what, which one of these choices do you think is the uh, most important path for Chinese manufacturing to uh, walk out of its current predicament. Number one is brand, second is business model, C is uh, technological innovation, quality of manpower, government policy, and others. You can only choose one. And uh, <laughs> if you choose F, uh, you should tell us what they are, what it is. And actually, uh, quality of manpower is also very important. Recently, uh, we had a show on CCTV discussing the differences between Chinese uh, manufacturing personnel and overseas. Uh, most of the Chinese viewers are surprised to know that uh, in, in Germany, only 35% of high school graduates go to universities. 65% uh, go to polytechnic schools or vocational training schools. And I have personally visited uh, some car manufacturing bases in Germany. And I was surprised to see that the so-called blue workers in Germany uh, work in uh, beautiful factories that resemble certain MoMA museums around the world. Beautiful wooden flooring, robots, good coffee, resting areas, they listen, they listen to music. They work in an environment much better than many of those investment bankers on Wall Street. It sounds like CCTV. <laughs> the blur between white collar and blue collar is, uh, there, there's no definitive line between blue collar and white collar, whereas in China, we have been building universities uh, again and again and again. And uh, to the extent that whenever we have an unemployment issue, we have too many white collar college graduates who are unwilling to take what they might, keep, what they might consider to be um, blue collar 
jobs. Okay, what sh can you show us your answers so that our camera can take a closer look at each and every one of them? Uh, Kevin's choice is F, private sector, uh, others. Uh, patience, time. Is that uh, C or D, Baika? Uh, C, including D. <laughs> Technological <laughs> quality and manpower. Okay, C, including D. Technology innovation. And Gary's choice is business model. Business model. Kevin, why don't we start from you? Uh, sure. Why private sector? Well, I've already in my remarks uh, earlier today spoken a lot about the critical nature of investing still in technology and in labor skills. I take that as a given. Why have I put a circle around um, others and, circ and identified private sector? Is that, as I said, there's nothing inherently wrong with China's um, Guoying Chie, it's state owned enterprises. Um, they do remarkable innovation and they have been remarkably successful. But for there to be full domestic competition in this economy, which means full domestic competition also in terms of access to capital markets and access to, shall I say, of the sharpest competitive edge of R&D development, which means a lot of um, competition between firms, I think this is partly a missing element in Chinese economic policy equation. I know it's a sensitive topic in China's own domestic political discourse, but given that we're providing free advice today, I thought we should do so. Um, and uh, I think uh, this will un unleash a whole bunch of new productivity in this economy and a whole bunch of new innovation in this economy which hasn't been thought of yet. Um, but I think it's access to market, access to capital, and frankly the good edge of that will be a new competitive uh, situation within this vast economy on the technological innovation front. But Kevin, didn't you realize that you made very frequent visits to China lately? Yeah. And didn't you realize that all of a sudden everybody in China is in the PE business? We have a saying in Beijing that if you threw a ball out of your window in one of the office buildings in the central business district of Beijing, you'll probably hit 11 PE guys. Hmm. All of a sudden, everybody wants to, to be the money guys. And uh, particularly those, those private sector guys, they're all, after they've made a lot of money from the manufacturing sector, uh, so many of them choose to invest a lot of money into financial hmm. investments or vehicles instead of investing on R&D. But I agree with your point. And that's why the people who impress me in this country are small, medium, and some large-scale, frankly, manufacturers who are entirely privately owned and doing their own stuff. I'm not talking about private, private financial markets. I'm not talking about those who are engaged in um, PE. Um, what I'm talking about is people who are innovative in their businesses, making things, innovating, growing their businesses, but who say to me, as an interested uh, outsider, Hai Shi Lao Wei, um, is um, when I come here is uh, listening to what they say about Difficulty of gaining access to finance, difficult of access to markets. Yeah. And my own view is it'll work so enormously successfully for China over the next 10 years if this sector of the economy, in manufacturing, in industry, not in financial services, um, that's fine to look after itself, uh, is able to really take off. Uh, that way you will have, I believe, a global Chinese brand, for example, in auto, which may not be a state-owned enterprise. It could be some private firm who's barely starting off in the black back blocks of Hubei as we speak here today. In that case, your choice is actually E. You're talking about government should provide more incentives for private sector to focus or return to the, to the, to the manufacturing sector or give, give the private sector more access to what might be monopolized uh, sectors by the state. I think my view about uh, government policy here is not about incentives. Uh, my point about policy here is uh, a complete level playing field for private sector players. Um, that is an element of government player, uh, policy that's uh, causing policy to run uh, mm -hmm. That is, and to allow all these others to truly let a hundred flowers bloom in the Chinese economy. <laughs> um, and I think that is going to be enormously successful in manufacturing and the rest of the services sector as well. So I said, the Goying Chie have a huge historical role they have reformed themselves enormously and are producing enormous innovation. But I think the whole strength of the diversity of the Chinese economy would take off if that occurs. Carlos. Yeah, well, I'm going to be short. I think uh, when you take a look first to the 
history of manufacturing development in many countries compare where China is today, I think China is in a very good position. The balance between government policy, technology innovation, adaptation of business model, even evolution of the brand, uh, I think it's a good balance. Uh, the risk is to become impatient, that one accelerate the move and then we start to fall into traps. So I think by being patient and continue to do uh, what is being done, uh, you know, uh, China manufacturing is going to be in great, uh, in, in great shape. And when you take a look at how many jobs have been created, how much investment is being done in the manufacturing sector, what is the offer of products offered to Chinese consumer today compared to five or ten years ago? I mean, frankly, you can't expect more or faster. It's absolutely remarkable what has been done. This being, doesn't mean, I'm not pushing for complacency, I'm just saying, just let's take a look to how China was, what was the offer for consumer five years ago, what's the offer for consumer today, how many jobs have been created in the manufacturing sector, how much investments have been done in the manufacturing sector. I think if we continue on this trend, China's going to be in good shape. So patience, do with time, look at the other history of developing, uh, de developing industry. I think China is one of the best stories, in fact, when we compare to, to other cases. And even when we compare to the other BRICS, you compare the development of manufacturing in China to the development of manufacturing in India or the manufacturing in Russia or in Brazil, I think we have a great story here. But do you think what, what, what I've been mentioning, uh, a Chinese phenomenon, which is uh, there are too many private businessmen channeling their money, profit from manufacturing into the financial investments, is that a global phenomenon as well for the past uh, decade? You, you know, I, I think this is something which is, uh, you, you cannot avoid that uh, in the development process, people start to diversify and then they come back to manufacturing. I don't think, frankly, it's a major issue. I think little by little, it will get back to order. What's encouraged me a lot is the fact that, for example, in the case of China, whenever there is a so-called, uh, uh, you know, decline of the growth, you know that this year, the forecast 7.5% of growth for China, which no country, no other major country will have, which is already a great, a great achievement, uh, but the government has announced another uh, set of investments in infrastructure. And I think it's very smart. That means every time you develop the infrastructure, you prepare the country for another leap in terms in term of development. And this is one of the main differentiators between China and the other developing market is how much China is putting focus on infrastructure. You know? and, and every single time there is an opportunity, massive investments are being done in infrastructure. And that's a very good sign for the future. And if I may quickly add, most of the uh, car companies in China uh, are witnessing their sales going down. What about Nissan in I'm China? Sorry, are, there, the sales of mo most yeah. car manufacturers in China are going down right now. That's uh, a sign of uh, the... Well, unless, unless my guys are showing me wrong statistics, I think we're still going up. Uh, we're still going up. Huh? We, we, I mean, the market is up. The market is, this year, the, the car market is up 7% passenger car market, light commercial vehicle is zero, and the forecast for the next year is still market going up six to seven percent. So people say, yeah, maybe six, seven percent. Six, seven percent is one million additional car every year. One million additional car every year that don't exist today. It's a lot of additional capacity. It's a lot of work. No, I think the industry is fine. Obviously, the industry has been used to grow 15, 20 percent a year. But this is unsustainable. We all knew that it would be unsustainable. But still, six to seven percent. I think it's a it's a it's a great perspective. Faika. Yeah, <clears throat> I said uh, I choose for C, including D. I said, um, if China wants to move to high tech manufacturing, more on the high end, innovation is inevitable. So we need to invest in innovation, technology, new technologies need to be there. Also, because China is so big. China has a responsibility, I think, to contribute with innovation to the world. If you take the billion richest people, which are mainly not living in China, to be honest, in Japan, in Europe, and oh. the United States, the billion richest people in the world consume roughly 45% of all global resources. Now, what we are doing is we are moving up China gradually to the same consumption levels, step by step, as in the West. Well, this is an unsustainable model. The West needs to learn to do more with less, and if not, other countries will learn the West to do less with less, 
because they claim 45% of all global resources, which is unsustainable. But also China cannot come to the same consumption level because the world is not one billion and another billion Chinese, but also the Indians and other people are coming. So we need innovation. Now, having said so, um, you need also people to do that innovation. And, and here is, I think, a big task for China, how to change the mindset of people in laboratories, people in research, uh, all kinds of people, to do new innovations in a different way than maybe the low-cost manufacturing mindset required in the past. And I think that that shift in mindset, and we see that also in our own research laboratories, um, that shift in mindset, that will be the biggest challenge, I think, for China. My answer is C. Technological innovation. The reason that I want to choose C is because everybody knows that the manufacturing in China are facing the greatest challenges in the history that we do not have a very effective technology. Let me take the example of the auto industry. Even though we are the first manufacturing nation in this world, but we lack of the core competitiveness. For example, the engines, the automatic transmissions, the electronic systems of the auto industries. We are left behind of others. We should say we are very backward in technology in the core competitiveness. We are only a little bit better than, than zero. For example, auto transmission, we uh, do not have any technology, we can say that. So the manufacturing industry lacking of the core competitiveness is the biggest challenge that we are facing now. In order to realize our transformation in technology, I guess this is the first important thing. It shall be put on high on the list. You do not allow me to choose other answers, but I still want to take this chance to share with you some of my observations, which is policy support. Chen Gang, some of your introduction has already introduced this question to us. Because for the past years, the reform and open up in China for the past years have given us a boost in its economy. However, there is such a disturbing fact that we put a lot of input in infrastructure, in the tangible uh, industry, but we didn't really come through a very direct route. There are some zigzags. Nobody wants to put it in the tangible industry. They all want to put it in the financial market to earn some hard and quick money. They want to be speculative. They want whatever industry which can give them some speculative interests. However, in the tangible industry, we could say that no matter from policy, environmental perspective, we are facing serious challenges. I guess the policy support shall be regarded as one factor. Thank you. That's from me. So uh, I chose, actually what I was really going to do was uh, strike F and put all of the above, but I don't think I was going to be able to get away with that. So uh, I chose business models, and I uh, totally agree with my colleagues who, who chose other areas, particularly innovation, uh, but I, I came across as I think there's more fundamental blocking and tackling around skill sets uh, that might be uh, uh, more appropriate and technology could be acquired elsewhere. So that was the logic for that. I think when we look at business models, um, I think it's, it's, it's instructive to take a look at what many leading global manufacturers are doing today. And in some sense, uh, the, the, the global manufacturers is, is really a borderless society right now. Uh, uh, they have assets placed uh, all over the world for very specific competitive reasons, assets in certain countries where they can campaign uh, a competitive advantage around product development, uh, assets in other parts of the world where they can uh, gain a competitive advantage around customer support or logistics. Um, and uh, th these assets uh, have people 
also scattered all over the world uh, that have different cultures and different skill sets and different uh, philosophies. And, and these are the leading uh, global manufacturing businesses today. And it just seems that, 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 that China needs to take lessons from that and find out where they can play and where they can get involved uh, in the global market and make decisions about where, they're where is their sweet spot, where are they going to choose to invest up and beyond their historic uh, low-cost uh, production environment. So uh, business models is uh, what I came up with. Uh, Mr. Xi, I have two I'll additional questions. questions. Uh, two follow-up questions for Mr. Xu. One is there are another two school of thoughts in China now about manufacturing. One believe that uh, um, Apple is a good model uh, for Chinese uh, companies, manufacturing, to study, because it is not just offering a product, it is offering services. It is offering uh, an experience um, so that even car manufacturers need to think about that, how to uh, offer services as well as and experiences as well as product itself. Uh, and secondly, uh, another topic for discussion is that increasingly we see some of China's largest manufacturers are setting up factories overseas as well. They are expanding overseas. Huawei obviously has done that extensively around the world and recently Lenovo has been setting up uh, factories and plants uh, um, around as well. I know that uh, your company has been doing the same. Is that part of the, uh, the strategy, the trend that uh, other companies should follow suit? Actually, two questions. I would like to take the first question. Apple, except for providing products, but also, most importantly, the services, I have very deep experience. Even though I'm not using any Apple product now, but I do know that so many people are using iPhone. After using iPhone, especially in its functionality of the iPhone, the, there are lots of uh, applications in the App Store, and there is a great potential. Such potential is enormous to imagine, so it has a radiating effect to all the other software developers providing services to Apple products. And they are all using the Apple platform to develop itself. So many users, Apple users, are using such platform. On the other end, Apple can also have some commission fees out of that through this platform. So I think the business uh, model of Apple is very effective. And I was told recently that in China, uh, one of the very famous brands, Hire, the home appliance manufacturer, uh, in the future, Hire will not produce products. It will just provide services instead of refrigerators and air conditioners. So I think this was, will be the future of our industry. Zhang Jianmin, who is the CEO of Hire, we all learn from him a lot. Just now you come to the second question about the overseas expansion of the Chinese enterprises. And and many people say that this is one of the must go path for the Chinese enterprises to be part of the globalization. I think it really depends on your own enterprise and really depends on particular sector. I cannot make any comment on others, but I can tell you something about Bike, my company. If you want to expand overseas, you need to do things well domestically. You need to do a very good domestic market on the basis of the accumulation of talents, experience, management skills, product management, then we can just expand overseas. Expanding overseas, to me, uh, we are not trying to be so so-called achievements or whatever. We do not need to make ourselves so flowery. Yeah, we do not need to be Vanity. We need to put ourselves down to earth and open the international market. 
It doesn't necessarily mean that you need to expand to all the continents. How many manufacturing centers do we have? We have set up the headquarters in how many cities? It doesn't really make sense to me. Some companies in China, when they expand overseas, some leaders of some corporations, they do have such a pursuit of vanity. Uh, we want to establish a factory in the U.S. or whatever. I think this is totally unrealistic. What is even more ridiculous is that they didn't even have a strong company in China, and they, they want to expand overseas. It's totally nonsense. <laughs> It seems that the international market has a higher profit and bigger market, and then it's better than the Chinese market. I really want to ask them, do you have a reliable technology? Do you have a good management team? If you go to the international market, will you be successful? Yes, indeed. The outside world is marvelous. There are great opportunities. But it doesn't really mean that you just scratch your head and then everything is coming to you naturally. So all the enterprises, they need to have their own strategies. It's very hard for me to comment on others. Bike. My company wants to put ourselves down to earth. We want to just maintain a good domestic market, and then we expand to the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wonderful speech. We only have uh, two minutes left. Um, uh, it's a shame that we couldn't interact more with uh, the audience in the floor. Maybe we take two very brief questions. Very brief. The questions have to be shorter than 20 seconds. Even. And the answers will have to be in the lines of 20 seconds as well. Sorry. <laughs> but actually, I have two questions. <laughs> take one. One. Okay. Um, my first question actually to Mr. Mr. Xu, Xu 20 seconds. I have to, I'll, I'll have to stop you if you if you Xu want to Xu 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 Just now you have mentioned, Mr. Xu mentioned that innovation will play a very important role in the transformation of technology in China. We are very happy to get that answer, but I want to know in bike, your company, uh, what measures uh, have you already taken to have the breakthrough in technology and what is the input and what is the proportion of the input in, in technology? Technology. And the other gentleman, the last question. Uh, Mr. Xu, you have to be very uh, short in answer. Question for all the uh, panelists. You know, Chinese government come up with a lot of uh, new policies to encourage the development of the service industry. So what's the relation between the upgrading of the manufacturing and the development of the service industry? And what kind of... Uh, potential business opportunities that the upgrading of manufacturing will bring to the service industry. Thank you. Very short question. And then our, our, each of our panelists will give a short summary and, uh, at, while answering the questions at the same time. Thank you. Just now you have been talking about the third industrial revolution. Especially this morning I have met Chairman Xu. Can you please just introduce us the characteristics of the so-called third industrial revolution? The lady? I want to ask Chairman Xu about the institutional reform, especially the reform of SOE. Uh, do you think the reform of SOE will be the focus of our future economic reform? Kevin? Very briefly, because we're running out of time. Three of those questions went to Mr. Xu, so over to you, Mr. Xu. <laughs> the, uh, one did not, and it went to the whole question of um, service industry um, uh, technological uh, revolution in manufacturing and interconnection between the two. My simple response to that is there has been a fashion in the West for the last 30 years which says that manufacturing ultimately uh, is uh, an old industry which will die and it will simply move across the world to lower and lower uh, labour cost centres. That uh, model of thinking I always thought was wrong. It's doubly wrong today for the reasons that we have gone through. And secondly, uh, in terms of the future of the services industries, what we can see is a fusion between high-end high manufacturing and the services industries in a much more direct way, uh, which frankly is good in terms of uh, high-wage jobs. It's also good in terms of creative workplaces for people. 
خلاص And then if the, some time is left, we, we can answer. Uh, three questions for you. Actually, I just want to put it very simply. The first about the technological innovation for us, Bike has adopting a, such an innovative, uh, in, integrated and open model innovation. Before Ms. SLEs, I think your question, especially what I learned about the Senior Government 18th Party Congress, one of the subjects of discussion of the 18th Party Congress is the reform at SOEs. This is a must. Carlos? Yeah. Well, uh, come back to the question. I think manufacturing and services go hand in hand. Um, and we have plenty of examples, the telephone and all the apps going with the telecommunication, the car and all the application now. That, that's, it's not a coincidence that today Google, Microsoft, all the companies are interested in co-development with the, with the car manufacturer because they see it as the next place where services can be sold. So without any doubt, we can illustrate in many areas of the industry that manufacturing and services go hand in hand. Fica. Well, we may feel awkward giving advices to China since Europe needs urgently advices, but um, I think uh, all in all, China is very well positioned because if local manufacturing will go together in the future with the high-end manufacturing together with R&D and technology, you have the unique combination. And um, including, it's not only the vision and the direction, but the execution strengths to do something like that. Well, this might be indirect also an advice to Europe then. So uh, uh, quickly uh, on, the, on the comment on overseas, I just don't see how China can stay in the game if they do not have overseas exposure. Dealing with uh, uh, business partners with different business philosophies, uh, different business objectives, different cultures, uh, the, the, the world has gone global. It's going to continue to go on global. And I just don't see how China can, can, can stay in the game if they... Uh, if they're not a part of an overseas activity. Thank you all, gentlemen. A really warm round of applause. Thank you.